Last time we talked about vlogging, we discussed how it can be used to bring out a more personal perspective of you. This form of content works well with sharing your every day to day life and at times can make people more engaged to watch. This is because people will most likely want to know more about you and what happens in your life. What we didn't discuss though was how you could use that to your advantage as a way to warp your audience's perception of you and everyone around. Hi guys, it's um, 1.45 in the morning and I'm finally by myself, <laughs> which I know doesn't sound that crazy to be by yourself at 45 in the morning, but um, this week's been pretty hectic, and there have been a lot of people, a lot of people around, telling me what to do, giving me advice. Before we get into the video, I'll be talking about today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For many people, the internet is a place to explore, a place for people to feel united and freely express themselves. However, at times, websites, songs, and movies might be blocked in your existing country, which I know for me, if I came across a blocked website when researching a topic, that would cause a lot of frustration. But thanks to Atlas VPN, I am able to gain access to any websites regarding things such as news articles that are blocked in my country. Not to mention, I'm addicted to Netflix. I live in Canada and I'd argue that we have the best Netflix. However, there are shows I'd like to binge at times but aren't available to me. I mean, look look at this huge list of shows I can't watch on Netflix because I'm in Canada. Pawn Stars being one of them. Like, this show is pretty awesome. I just really like seeing people buy and sell stuff for crazy amounts of money because I know I could never afford the stuff they show in each episode. I really want that first edition Charizard. Anyways, thanks to Atlas VPN, I am able to binge shows such as this. They also have a variety of other neat and useful tools from just simply letting you gain access to blocked websites. They have this cool new thing called Tracker Blocker. Tracker Blocker provides an extra layer of privacy while surfing the web. It prevents data brokers from using third-party trackers to gather insights about your online activities, which data brokers then sell to companies and advertisers. In this way, it safeguards you from annoying and potential dangerous advertisements that follow you around the internet. This will also stop annoying pop-up ads and help protect you against websites using malware as well. It's easy to install and easy to use. You simply just have to choose any country and swipe to connect. They have a huge list and variety of connections you can choose from as well. They also have an option for support if you need help with anything such as installing the program on your device. It works with iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. Now, not only is it useful, but by using my link in the description, it's extremely cheap. They have made it so anyone that clicks on the link below will receive an 86% discount, making it only $1.39 a month, being billed only $50 every three years, and with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So go to atlasvpn.com slash for the spectacular deal. Relationships are inevitable. There's something where no matter what we do in life, we'll eventually come across. Whether it be a friendship or something more intimate, they're the very thing that for most people keeps the clock ticking in this thing we call life. Which is what causes loyalty and bonds between two or even a group of individuals. How you interpret those around you, however, is merely up to your discretion. No matter how intimate and close people may seem, relationships with others are commonly broken off. The internet being a place to share every thought you have, it's not strange to be a witness to watching these breakups between people ignite. Whether it be from a video your favorite content creator uploaded about how they and their partner had broken up, or it be a long thread on Twitter regarding someone whom you've known who ended up being abusive towards those around them. Today's topic, David Dobrik, has been brought to mine and many others' attention. While he is at the center of today's video, there's of course his associates that have caught my eye as well. While not the main priority of discussion, they will not be thrown under a rug. If you know me, I like to make sure I can put as much on the table as possible. This won't be the last time they're mentioned in a video of mine anyhow. What's up guys, a lot of you guys are wondering why I have to delete my last vlog, and that's because I made an offensive joke that at the time I didn't think was too offensive. But after reading some comments, I realized that a lot of you guys didn't like it as much as I thought you were going to. For those of you guys who found the vlog to be offensive, I'm sorry you did. For those of you who didn't find it to be offensive, I'm sorry they did. David Dobrik has been a staple of the vlogging scene for quite some time. He's known for his short vlogging style, which has both allowed him to keep his audience entertained and allow them to be more easily engaged with his content. He's also prone to having some sort of celebrity guest show up, like that one guy from Drake and Josh. Don't worry, it's not that one. Well, despite the few times he appeared in his videos, but that was before 
everything. His content varies from pranks, stunts, or just him creating silly moments with his friends. Through this, he has accumulated over 18 million subscribers, with a loyal fan base tuning in every upload. You may also know him and his friends under the group name, The Vlog Squad. People who are generally known in the group are Jason Nash, Josh Peck, Heath Usar, Scotty Sire, and so on. Which, by the way, I'm sorry if I butcher any names going forward in this video. I apologize. I'm not good with names. With this many people collabing at such extremes, it's only bound for people to split off, which over the years has happened. Gabby Hanna, Dirty Dom, and Trisha all being prime examples. Though, Trisha has gone to be very vocal about the group since her leaving, displaying many reasons about her distaste for a majority of the people in Involved, which is what reflects onto today's conversation. You see, our buddy David landed himself into a sticky situation, with multiple people coming out against him regarding their experiences within the vlog squad, serious allegations made against other members, David's poor behavior with how he treats his friends, and much, much more. So come with me as we venture through this mess, and hopefully along the way, you can learn something. Um, this video today is something that I just, I have to make because like, it's out there and it's embarrassing and it's humiliating and um, I tried to call, talk to David and I tried to call Jason and both of them seemed to play it off as crazy people, psychotics would and just to be like, oh, sorry, didn't know, no, didn't, sorry again. And then Jason tried to, he didn't even apologize, didn't have any regrets or any remorse, and so I said, okay. Now as said before, Trisha Paytas had made videos regarding her departure from the vlog squad, a notorious video where she had come forward talking about how member Brandon Cavillio was dating a minor. Brandon, in their friend group, was dating a high schooler last year. She was 17 years old. And when I would talk about this with like David, he would literally be like, oh, see, it's a big deal. He's 24, like she's 17. Like, you know, just cause it's the law, like a year, like a six months and six months she'll be 18. I'm like, it's disgusting. Her claims would go forth to become more extreme. David had wanted to set up a bit for his vlog where they would run off a joke Jason and David had for a while, where Jason, a 44 year old man, convinces David into trying to get Trisha and Tana to have a three way with Jason. If you can get Tana to have a three way with me and Trisha, I'll fucking buy you a Ferrari. I'll do anything. I'll be your slave for a year. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. You would buy me a Ferrari. I, I, I can't buy you a Ferrari, but I mean, I'll, I'll put a lot of money towards a Ferrari. You'll buy me a Ferrari. $100,000. Actually, you can make that happen. You can't run to Trisha with this piece of video and be like, Jason said, Jason said. Damn it. <laughs> Trisha, can you help me with my video? You would do anything for me? I'd do anything for you. Can you and Jason have a threesome with Tana? Trisha explains in her video that both Tana and her didn't want this, but David kept pushing for it. A couple vlogs ago, he's like, he didn't have a, a a bit a big bit for his vlog and so we go over there and he's like how how bad do you want to help me and then i got pissed at him i got pissed at him that night and i said you know not everything is for your freaking vlog no it's just a vlog um and so i got really really pissed and um they still invited tana over anyways which and i don't blame tana on any of this like i have no ill feelings towards her she's really cool to me like she's always like i just want to be your friend i just want to hang out like <laughs> and i'm and so, like, I don't think she, and she's always, like, repulsed by it. And so, like, I, I have, no, this is nothing to do with her. And she's, a you know, a 20-year-old girl. She was, like, 18 or something when they went on that date. So, it's like, you know, she's just trying to live her life outside. She has a boyfriend, whatever. So, I, I'm, this is nothing against her. And then they invited her over anyways, and I was asleep. But I could kind of hear, and her just being like, no, that's, like, gross. Like, no offense, but that's gross or whatever. And it's gross. Jason's 45, I'm 30. It's gross. It's gross. Though many people didn't really care for what Trisha had to say, people were rather skeptical of her claims as they thought a lot of the judgment was coming out of impulse. This all changed, however, from when she became the co-host of the Frenemies podcast with well-known commentator H3H3. This opportunity allowed her experiences to hold much more weight within the community and branch out to a wider audience. People had taken her claims more seriously since she had H3 supporting them. She went more in depth on the podcast and explained how David asked for both Trisha 
Portia and Tana to go into a room with Jason and have Jason take off his shirt, then have the two of them pretend to have intercourse with him. They both declined, however, Trisha says that David kept pushing for the both of them to do it and wouldn't take no for an answer, despite the both of them being severely uncomfortable. He specifically called me and Jason and said, can I use the bit where Tana comes over and Jason tries to fuck her? And I was like, no. Jason says no. I'm on the phone with David at 2 a.m. He posted his vlog anyways. It happens. I'm like crying and blowing my eyes out. And he's like, it won't happen again. Two days later, it's just him, Jason, Madison Beer, and Tana, and they do that exact same joke again, and I, that's when I lost my shit. I'm like, I'm making a fucking video. I did not consent to it. I said I was uncomfortable. You pushed Tana to do this joke, and Tana's like, I don't want to, he's like, I remember this so clearly. When Tana came over to the house, when I said don't invite her, he's like, can you guys just go in the room, and Jason takes his shirt off, and you guys like pretend like you're having sex, and she's like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, we said no so many times, and like, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. She added onto the podcast about a time where David came into her apartment, repeating the same joke about Jason and Trisha having a threesome with Tana, despite him knowing the joke makes Trisha uncomfortable. Me as much. Uh, Tana just called actually. She wanted to. <laughs> Again, not interested. <laughs> I didn't make the joke. He did. I don't want to have a threesome with Tana. Guys, chill. This is the stupidest fucking fight ever. She doesn't like Tana jokes. But drop it. So, oh, did you, you actually get mad in this Tana? moment, or is this just part of the guy? Oh my god, we had so many fights so over tell, this. So, give me some insight to what happened. You'll see. I take here. my clothes off. I take my clothes off in this bit. Like I fucking go. I lose my shit. I could completely. Why did you take your clothes off? Because I didn't want him to use it in the in the vlog. I'm like, if I get completely naked, he can't use it. You'll see he like leaves it in and like blurs it out. <laughs> Trisha's response to this was to lift up a portion of her clothes, revealing nudity in hopes that David would cut out the entire bit. But David had left it in anyhow and put blurring over her. While some people might see this as a crazy stunt pulled by Trisha, if I were in David's shoes and I were saying something in the vlog, knowing that it makes someone uncomfortable and the reaction was to get naked so the vlog wouldn't be uploadable, I wouldn't have blurred it out like David did. I would have deleted the vlog. In fact, I would have stopped recording then and there after the realization that what I'm doing clearly isn't having a good mental impact on the person I'm vlogging. Trisha has even talked about the impact that both Jason and David have had on her mental health. Regarding the time that both of them had visited her at a hospital after she overdosed and in reaction to seeing David, she said she got naked and ran outside of her room in which she was then sedated and sent to a mental hospital. Yeah, I went to a mental hospital for the first time in my life after David and Jason. Like they showed up to the hospital to see your sign before going to a mental hospital and then they admitted to me a mental hospital as soon as they came i tried to run off the stretcher david and jason were both back there in the hallway of your sign i'm like why are you both fucking back here david wait wait, wait what why so was what, he, he wasn't filming was he they were out filming but they weren't filming in the thing so they were out filming jeff wittick came and i was like what the fuck like i I like whatever my makeup artist took me to the hospital. You didn't want to see them or what? No, I did not want to see them. Jason was like, okay, I guess to be back there because we were like kind of dating at the time. But as soon as David got back there, I took off all my clothes and made a run for it outside of the hospital. And they took me and they gave me, um, they sedated me. And then they told me I had to go to a mental hospital. When you saw David, you just were like, I don't want to. I freaked the fuck out because I, I was already in a, in a panic, like in a state of panic. And um, like when I woke up, because I like, I kind of like overdosed. And then I woke, I came to in Cedar Sinai and I like, he was back there. And I was so embarrassed and then I saw David and I was so fucking livid because that's why I mean the whole thing started from D David whatever the fuck when David went into her apartment and kept running on with the three-way bit he was clearly trying to get a reaction out of Trisha and he got that reaction which is why he left that bit in the podcast led to many other doors opening up a few former members had contacted Ethan and asked to talk about their experiences within the group and with David it all started with Nick, who had talked about how David would make jokes ridiculing him, which led the fans of the Vogs to do the same thing because they thought it was okay as they saw David do it. This inevitably affected his mental well-being, so he asked David to stop making these type of jokes, which David had agreed to do, though afterwards, he stopped asking for Nick to be in any future content. Yeah, I basically <clears throat> told him, like, dude, I don't want to make these jokes anymore. Hmm. And he was just like, okay, like, that's fine. Like, he was chill about it, whatever. Um, and I knew by saying that I wasn't going to be in the content anymore. But after that, yeah, like I just because I didn't want to like get made fun of, like it was just like, all right, like I respect that, bro. And then that was that. And it wasn't like, oh, that um, sounds fucked up. I got to actually interject. You said, yo, I just I don't want you to make fun of my height anymore. And that was and he's like, OK, well, there's no point of having you in the vlogs then. Right. That was kind of the. That doesn't seem very. That I got. That but, doesn't sound like, very he good. He never to me. vocally said that. You know what I mean? But that was for sure the vibe. Another former member then reached out to H3, known as Seth, who had previously been vocal about David and his racist behavior in a video called "Accountability to All Content Creators." Only black friend, don't ruin this for me, okay? This is Alex. 
Alex, you probably already know. What's yeah. up? Hey, Seth, do you want something to drink? What you? Come on, on the podcast, he discussed the aftermath of a bit David set up. You see, Seth originally was going to do a bit where a girl was going to be wearing a mask and kiss Seth. However, David swapped out the girl with Jason without Seth's acknowledgement because he thought it would be funny, inevitably leaving Seth to kiss Jason. Oh, let, let, let's talk about this. What really made me happy. What? Today, we pulled a prank on oh. on my friend Seth. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's now you probably, can talk about it. It's probably the best prank I've ever I've ever pulled on anyone in my opinion. It was we have this scary mask um, that we've been pranking people with and it's just a scary mask and everyone knows that that that, it, that it's it's a mask. And I told him I told Seth, "Hey man, I want to do this bit. It's like a dream sequence where you where you make out with the mask guy and it just looks like you're dreaming and you're making out with an old man because the mask makes you look like an old man." And I'm like, "Corinna's going to be in it. And Corinna's a girl in, in my vlogs." And he's like, and he's he thinks Corinna's really attractive. So Corinna's like, kind of like the hot girl in David's vlogs. Yeah. So, so so he's like, so he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm totally down." And I'm like, "Yeah, Seth, just don't hold back. You can make out as much as you want. Have as much tongue as you want. Just keep kissing her." And, but what, what Seth didn't know is that I replaced Corinna with Jason. <laughs> so Jason was under the mask and, and everyone's, everyone, everyone in the room's like, this isn't going to work. This everyone gonna doubted work. you. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. Brandon, Corinna, like this isn't going to work. This is stupid. Because of the size difference. Because of the size difference. about six feet and Corinna's about five, six. And then the bit starts going and Seth is there sitting on the couch. Jason walks in as Corinna. He's not speaking, obviously. Sits next to her. Seth leans in. And as he's leaning in, I'm like... Fuck yeah, I got it. It's game over. It's in the bag. I sit down, I put my hand, I put my hand on Seth's knee, and I put my hand behind his back and start rubbing his back and squeezing his knee. And then he just just leans in and just goes at it. I slip him the tongue first. <laughs> Like with tongue, they start making out. And at this point, we're like five seconds in and I'm like, this is it. This is what I wanted. I got what I wanted. I'm out. Like we can end this. And I'm like, Seth, Seth, like I'm ready to talk. He's coming. Hard. Now he's coming into my mouth with his tongue so hard. You can tell his, his tongue is. Did he, he grab my ass? He grabbed your ass. He grabs Jason's ass because he thinks it's Corinna. At this point, the poor dude probably has a boner. <laughs> and he's really making out with Jason. And I'm like, Seth, Seth, Seth. And I'm trying to get him to stop, but he thinks it's part of the bit. And he keeps going for 25 seconds. Literally, 20, I'm not over-exaggerating. It's in the vlog. 25 seconds making out with this guy. And I'm like, I, I, I literally, I think I looked up to the ceiling and I'm like, God, what did I do to deserve such <laughs> beauty? This, ladies and gentlemen, was David and Jason gloating about sexually assaulting their friend. Seth went on to explain how this incident left people questioning his sexuality, which made him uncomfortable and led him to moving states because he didn't want people coming up to him anymore, bringing up the situation as it was traumatizing to him. And, and moved to um, Atlanta because it, when I was in LA, um, after kind of dealing with that video with, with, with Jason, um, like the makeout video, you know, it's like now millions of billions of people kind of are misconstruing like my own sexuality and how I feel about participating in something that, mm. you know, he, that he didn't have my consent for. H3 and Trisha had also found an old clip of Trisha confronting both Jason and David about her concerns with the Seth prank. And David's response was him saying that Trisha being concerned is crazy. Nothing. I have nothing. I have a lot to complain about, but I'm not going to because Jason's going to me. <laughs> I have it working perfectly. <laughs> she was upset that I was going to make out with Seth, and so I slipped oh, out. You, you, you being mad about the Seth? Well, that's not true. I was here. Mad about the Seth makeout thing is crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. I said she's just. Was that real? Like him saying it's crazy three yeah, times, or yeah. was that edited? No, that's the clip, unedited. <laughs> you being mad <laughs> about your boyfriend making out with it? <laughs> oh, so, oh, I can't say that. Bleep that. As <laughs> saying. Another man is crazy, Trisha. Crazy.
crazy. crazy. <laughs> Afterwards, a former producer for the Vlog Squad, Jake Alda, sent an anonymous email to Trisha discussing how he too is a victim of the Vlog Squad. He then went on TikTok and talked about how he was the one who sent the email to Trisha and went on to describe how Jason kept trying to pressure him into taking his shirt off in front of an intoxicated girl for a bit, which he kept saying no. However, Jason and the intoxicated girl wouldn't take no for an answer. The girl then chased Jake around the room and pinned him down trying to take his shirt off and Jason filmed the whole thing. Jake tried to convince Jason for three hours to not upload the vlog and in response, he was fired three days later. I'm the guy that Trisha Paytas talks about in this clip. I worked for the vlog squad in 2017 and for two months I was practically with them 24 seven. And although I really appreciate working for them, I was put in a lot of very uncomfortable situations. One time at a 4th of July party, Jason was filmed with this girl who was very intoxicated. And uh, at one point, Jason wanted me to take off my shirt because he was thought it was, it was gonna be funny. Back then I had really bad body issues. I never even really took off my shirt alone and I didn't want to be, my body to be shown on camera. For 10 minutes, Jason and this girl kept begging me to take off my shirt and I kept on saying no. And I told him it made me uncomfortable. Eventually this girl chased me around the house, pinned me down and tried to rip off my shirt as Jason would provoke her. I felt like there was nothing I could do in the moment and I never gave him consent. Jason filmed the whole thing and he tried to put it in his next video and I convinced him for three hours not to because I felt humiliated. And he fired me a couple days later. I know my story isn't as bad as others and I have nothing against Jason or the vlog squad, but I felt like my story should be heard. These allegations had led an uproar in the community, so much that David started bleeding subscribers at a massive scale. This led to a current member, Scotty Sire, to make a video defending David, though his main arguments were against Seth's claims, saying he was bitter his career didn't go anywhere, diminishing his claims, and accusing him of only doing this for attention. He then followed up by explaining that Seth had done similar kissing pranks after the first, where he had consented to the second and third time. Do I have permission to try to prank you again and get you to make out with Jason? I'm very confused by that because how the hell could you be so confident to tell me that I have to consent to something that I'm not going to know that I'm going to do? <laughs> David films hours and hours of footage and crams them into four minutes and 20 seconds for his vlog. So this clip was cut short to not actually show Seth giving his consent, but showing David asking for the consent. Now, do you think David would go and film this bit if Seth had said no? No, there's no way in hell. Seth agreeing and giving his permission to film this bit again. He was like, there's no way you're gonna get it on me again. There's no way you're gonna get me again. So go ahead, go for it. You're the best, you're the fucking best, David. <laughs> This motherfucker told me that this was gonna happen again. And I can always respect the fucking man that keeps his word. <laughs> you can tell by his reaction at the end of the video that he was pranked, it was all in good fun, and he gave permission beforehand. He gave David props on getting him with that prank a second time. Some of David's vlogs happen just like in real time, you know, like and something will happen and he captures it on film. But most of these things are preconceived and everyone talks about like what bit is going to be filmed. So a lot of the things that Seth was in were his ideas. Not saying that these kissing pranks were his ideas, but he did give consent to them and he partook in them. He partook in several bits after and before the next ones and was totally fine with it. So let me, let me move on to the the second video because you had this first video where they quote unquote prank you where Jason pretends to be Corinna and makes out with you. And so a lot of people point to the second video as they say, well, this is proof that he was in on it and it's not that big of a deal because he, they, they did a second video where they pretended to cast you in a beef jerky commercial and then Jason comes out as a gorilla and makes out with you basically in the same style they did the first one. And so, and he says to you, I remember specifically, he says, do I have your consent to try to get Jason to make out with you again? And so tell me about how, how that video kind of played out and how you feel about that second video. Well, David was sitting there and, and, and we were sitting almost for like 20 minutes and he was talking to me about, he was like, yo, I want to do that prank again. I kept saying like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to have to go through that again. I don't want to deal with, you know, the repercussions of having all these people know, like, like that other video people are just starting to forget. I just want to keep it moving and not, you know, be involved in any sort of content like that anymore. And then David kind of keeps like, come on, man, like, you know, like what, what if, you know, how, how can I, how can I get you to, 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 you know, want to, oh, sorry about that. What, want to, um, you know, get, get your consent for this. And what people don't understand in that moment, I never gave him my consent. I said, yeah, I did how notice that. Expecting to do something to me that I don't know that you're going to That's all do. he included right. from you Should saying no. Good. It is important to note though that just because someone consents to something one time doesn't mean that they want it to happen another. It's an invalidation of that person's perspective and experience to simply just say, well, he was okay with doing it the times he knew it was going to happen. The problem is that David didn't 
ask and went along with doing it. Invading someone's personal space in the process, it's something that's been heavily criticized along YouTube for a long time with prank culture. The whole, it's just a prank bro, doesn't justify cause, it only brings forth intention. Though due to all the backlash, he deleted the video and released an apology not too long after, which was also then followed up by a video from ex-member Dirty Dom, where he had defended Seth, discussing the many arguments I brought forward. Now while it was in good faith for Dom to defend Seth, and in fact, I completely agree with what he had to say, it was however very poor timing for him to lecture somebody on consent, as an article was soon to be released, going in grave detail about how he really is off camera, and the irony that is the name Dirty Dom. She, so she says they cut out the extent of her intoxication. It seemed like I had a super fun night with these famous vloggers, basically, which is not at all what happened. Every single person I know is messaging me, oh, you were in David's vlog, that's so cool, or oh my god, I saw you in the vlog. On the day the vlog was released, it was viewed more than 800,000 times. People came up to Hannah in the library and at line of the coffee shop to talk about it. She said, Hannah said her little sister even texted her about overhearing people at Hannah's old high school talking about the vlog in the bathroom. It made Hannah feel so alone, she said. It's difficult to describe how it feels knowing that millions of strangers have seen a video of me in a night that affected me and traumatized me in nearly incomprehensible ways, not knowing that anything was wrong, Hannah said. The first time Hannah said she described what happened that night as the R word, she said she was in the back of a cab in her hometown after a night of drinking with friends. It was over winter break, a month after being filmed with the vlog squad. The next morning, Hannah said her friend asked her if she, was remem if she remembers that she had a panic attack in the car, and she started saying, I was R-worded over and over again on the way home. Insider journalist Kat Ten Barge posted an article regarding a drunken night involving the vlog squad. In the article, a woman using the name Hannah accused Dom of taking advantage of her while she was intoxicated and blackout drunk in a 2018 vlog that David had uploaded. Hannah said before she was intoxicated, she remembered Dom guiding her to a bedroom where she refused to hook up with him, and when she was leaving, she claims that Dom used his body to block the exit and told her that she had to at least kiss him first. She then kissed him because she was afraid he wasn't going to leave her alone. Then the worst was to come, but because she was blackout drunk during during the intimate situation, she had no recollection of that part of the night and gave Dom and David permission to upload the video. Her friend later told her what had happened. Her friend described that she had to take over because she was scared for Hannah, as Hannah seemed to be unresponsive when Dom was being intimate with her. So basically, Dom took advantage of a severely intoxicated girl, then her friend redirected Dom's attention to her to protect Hannah. Hannah had also looked into her legal options in California, but decided that the incident wasn't worth pursuing, because she was extremely intoxicated at the time and couldn't remember much of what happened. And since alcohol was given that night, despite all the girls not being the legal drinking age, in California, California, a drunk night that ends in a sexual encounter can turn into a lifetime sex offender registration and up to 8 years in prison, and whoever bought the alcohol can face fines up to $1,000 and community service. Jeff Wittick and Todd Smith were both pointed at as the people who bought the alcohol as the article mentioned multiple sources who had described it to be the two of them. The article then went on and focused on Hannah's friend's perspective, who goes by the name Sarah. Sarah went on to describe how David's friends kept trying to peek into the bedroom and tried listening on to what was happening. Them doing this wasn't out of concern, however, and was based on them teasing the girls and teasing Dom. Dom eventually did, however, lock the door to stop other Vlog Squad members from coming in while he was getting intimate. The original video that was uploaded was titled She Should Have Not Have Played With Fire and was deleted a year later when Hannah had sent a text message to Dom on how she felt. It was a very long and emotional message, which Dom responded very short and brief that the video would be deleted. It took her a long time to speak up about this as she had continued panic attacks and she only then spoke up when Trisha Paytas uploaded her video exposing the Vlog Squad. After the article was posted, David then finally decided to speak up and posted an apology video on his podcast channel. Though people were upset because he posted this on a channel with not even half his subscriber count, which made it look like he was hiding from criticism. It shows he wants to make sure that his wider audience doesn't know what's going on. It was a very brief and short video, only spanning to be two minutes long, which for sure seems very condensed already with everything that's been presented towards everyone, which turned out to be what the video was. A brief explanation that was overly condensed and didn't tackle anything being talked about head on. He discusses how he acknowledges his understanding of what consent is and takes it very seriously, then follows up discussing how he doesn't agree with a lot of the stuff that he used to do. Consent is something that's super, super important to me. Whether I'm shooting with a friend or shooting with a stranger, I always make sure that whatever the video I'm putting out, I have the approval from that person. 
Um, and I also acknowledge that those times where a person can change their mind and they decide that they no longer want to be associated or they no longer want to be in the video that I'm putting up and then I'll take the video down. And there's also been moments where I've looked back on videos and I realized that these don't represent me anymore and they're hurtful to other people and I don't, I don't want them up because I've, I've grown you know, as a content creator and as a person, and I don't agree with some of the videos I've posted. Which is good, I guess, because people do move on and change over time. It's natural that at one point you may consider one thing to be okay, then later on you realize that it probably wasn't the best thing to do. He however then talks about Seth and apologizes, though when he talks about Seth's situation, he's very vague as he doesn't actually talk about what happened. The, the Seth situation, I'm sorry to Seth because I, like I said, I I would just want to make videos where everybody in it, you know, whether you're participating or watching, is enjoying and having a good time. And I missed the mark with that one. And I'm really sorry. I, I truly, truly am. This matches with him wanting to suppress what people know of the actual situation, posting it on a second channel with a smaller viewer base, and talking about the incidents vaguely. This is a tactic used by most PR teams. They want to keep it small and subtle, and shield themselves behind the vague apology by claiming it's of genuine nature. Seth, however, made a response to David's apology, discussing how David's video seemed disingenuous because he only apologized in the video and not personally to him off camera. Trisha then followed up with a similar response, saying David doesn't understand what consent is, and that he deflected many of the arguments being thrown his way. Now since Jeff Wittick was named in the article, he decided to make a response as well, where he said that he had nothing to do with the threesome bit, though Trisha was quick to respond saying that he had bought the alcohol for the girls in the first place, which he responded with, maybe Dom bought it, maybe you did, maybe one of the girls did, wasn't me or Todd, nobody told me shit. I thought it was a consensual bit, though right after this he decided to delete the tweet. With both many ex Vlog Squad members coming out and the Insider article being released, this created a lot of noise in the community, especially with the article discussing Dirty Dom's behavior. This all however only led to more people coming out and for older allegations to resurface. I am aggressive when talking to women, uh, I will say that, and there's a difference between being forward and persistent, but what I was doing was just too intense and now I'm working on that. Many people went out of their way to go back and find a video created by Ali Hardesty. She came out with a video regarding Dirty Dom. She had met him at a party during VidCon, and when coming into contact with Dom, he had allegedly grabbed her by the waist. He would then go on to whisper into her ear, making flirtatious remarks. Dom then asked her to kiss, which she rejected, but Dom was being pushy. He had then started to pull her towards him, but she had gotten out then rejoined with her friends. When she brought this off forward to her friends, they all responded back by saying that's just how he is and that's how he acts in the vlogs, which is a lot of people's reaction when confronting Dom. Though I'm not surprised this was a response because Dom has always portrayed himself as this overly aggressive sexual guy, and how you act in your videos is going to be a reflection of how your audience reacts. She goes on to explain that later on, Dom had brought her out to the balcony and sat her onto a couch. He then pinned her down and was on top of her. He then told her to kiss him. And now he has me pinned down, so I'm trying to like play my cards carefully, and I'm still not understanding what kind of sick joke this is. And at this point, I don't think it's funny anymore. I don't think that he has a weird sense of humor. I just think that he's a total creep. So I turned to my left. I make eye contact with this dude, this bigger tall dude, he easily could have stepped in. He gives me a look kind of like, are you okay? But he almost like found it entertaining that this was happening. There was a bunch of people who saw this happening and didn't do anything about it. I gave him a look like, I don't know this dude, I wanted to get off of me, but I didn't say anything out loud because everyone else who was sitting nearby clearly heard me say it to the guy, Dirty Dom, right in front of me and they didn't do anything. So he still has me pinned down and he's trying to kiss me. I'm like literally moving my head to the side so he doesn't. Dom proceeded further and asked if I can get your bra size, will you make out with me. Dom then lets go of one of her arms and proceeds to put his hand down her shirt. Ali clarifies that there was another girl that had told her he did a similar thing. Dom also had a camera with him, which he speculates that he could have recorded him doing this with other girls at the event without their consent. He's trying to make small talk with me, flirty, like, hey, if I guess your bra size, then will you make out with me? And I was like, no, let me off. And he still won't take no for an answer. This is all going down. He had his camera on him and I asked him if he was recording this and he said no. So just some food for thought. Since there were allegedly other girls that were filmed without their consent or put in the video or something without their consent, maybe they didn't even know he was filming. In the second video Ali had made, she goes on to talk about how Dom had recorded a 15 year old girl at a party twerking without her consent. He also did not apologize to the 15 year old girl. Her and I have been in contact. I'm going to put a screenshot 
y'all up here. This is the girl that Elijah Daniel tweeted about who reached out to him and he anonymously posted a screenshot of her talking about how he filmed her ass dancing and a lot of people were mistaking me for her in the video. I received a lot of comments about that. I am 20 years old and I was invited to that party. My name was on the guest list. But regardless of age and regardless of invitation, I still don't believe it's okay for a guy to touch a girl or a girl to touch a guy. Anyone to touch anybody without consent. This was later on admitted by Dom in his My Apology video, though Dom says in the video that he didn't know the age of the girl. One of the issues I'm addressing is filming people without their permission. Um, there was a 15 year old girl that I filmed having fun at a party. It was an 18 plus event. However, recording someone without their consent, especially in this fashion, is still disgusting and follows Dom's behavior with how he treats women. But regardless of her age, what I did was wrong because I didn't ask her permission to be in my content. Dom had also commented on the allegations Ali made against him, saying that not everything is true, but to an extent it is. He then follows up by saying he's overly aggressive towards women. Accusations against me aren't 100% true, but to an extent they are. Um, I am aggressive when talking to women, uh, I will say that. And there's a difference between being forward and persistent, but what I was doing was just too intense and now I'm working on that. David Dobrik had also commented under the video congratulating Dom for being brave and for standing up for himself because somehow Dom saying he's aggressive towards women, filmed a girl twerking without her consent and vaguely admitting and denying sexual assault allegations is somehow brave to David. If Dom wanted to be brave, he would have told his audience what happened regarding the night with Ali. However, he decided to be vague when talking about the situation and it doesn't surprise me his audience at the time reacted positively to this video. Anyone who's watched him for a long time knows that he isn't the most courteous person towards women. So him making a vague comment then following up by saying he's disrespectful towards women and it's something he needs to work on isn't anything new to his supporting audience. He had mixed vague language with something that everyone already knows. His audience reacted to how they've always seen him act. This wasn't brave, it was manipulative. An old trend on YouTube was prank culture, where people would go out of their way in public and pull a gotcha on people. Many of these pranks ended up being staged however, but some were also real. A lot of people started to dissipate themselves from this content though, due to the realization that, I don't know, maybe doing things to people without their consent and knowledge of what's going on isn't actually that funny and more or less concerning. David is a prime example of current prank culture. An interesting prank was when David thought it would be funny to have Jason peek under changing rooms because they thought their friend was in one. Only for it to be someone else who they had been harassing. Jason and I went to the store to try on some new clothes for Coachella. Scott ended up finding something he liked so he went to the dressing room to try it on. Shortly after, Jason thought it would be funny to take his camera and stick it underneath the dressing room door to spy on Scott. Alright, that's all you need to know. Enjoy the rest of the video. Do you need help? You want me to come in there? You can slide under. Jason, he's fine. Let him let him try on his clothes. Get out of here, David. I'm trying to help. Do you want to like Oh, you're not going to let us... Oh, that's not Scott. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Jason's peering under the thing because he thought Scott was trying on clothes. And this other guy walks out and it's not Scott! Uh, so funny, invading another person's privacy and turning it into content. Another notable prank David had was where he pranked his friend into thinking he was being casted into a movie. Something his friend has always aspired to do, only for them to later find out it was all a joke. His friend had walked out of the room in anger, rightfully so mind you. They then filmed him having a full on mental breakdown and teased him afterwards. <laughs> oh my god. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I didn't hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Wait, you're really good. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Jonah, 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 they got me on Hollywood Boulevard, and I've been fighting for my life. <laughs> <laughs> he just laughed for the first time. <laughs> he was like, oh, everybody. Brandon, we did so much. I go, Brandon wrote a script, and he went, <laughs> <laughs> It was beautiful, dude. It wasn't beautiful. The way that you, dude, 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 dude I, like, I, 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 Brandon, tell How me. did you read the line that I put on page two? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what Jason said, but I mean, it's just, it's what we do. It's why we do it better than most people. 
Next, because you. we literally want, we literally make people want to end their own lives. <laughs> I wouldn't really consider this to be the best mindset to have, but hey, you gotta make that content, right? Even if it makes your friends want to harm themselves, because that's how you apparently make good content. David also thought it would be a good idea to bring a horse into a restaurant without the owner's consent. Crazy last night, you couldn't get the horse in Saddle Ranch. Yeah, we got, oh yeah, we did this, we did this whole bit. for So for Zane's birthday, I had this whole party montage planned. Um, it was gonna be fun. Like there's a bunch of little elements, and one of the elements was I got a horse um, that he could ride into the bar, um, like a real horse. Now I didn't tell the owner of the bar that I had this horse <laughs> because I I live by this thing, you know. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness later. So I thought maybe if I got the horse there and he saw that the horse was chill, he'd let the horse <laughs> ride into the bar. Which I know, I know this was a stretch, but I ah yes. Disrupting business because you're rich and bored, but hey, you gotta focus on making that good content, right? You don't need to care about how other people feel because content. David had also put caterpillars on Emma Chamberlain, who happens to have a severe phobia of caterpillars and wasn't aware he was going to do it. She had a panic attack on camera as David and Zane laughed at her, but again, content. Okay, in three, two, surprise. I'm not gonna look. You have to look. <laughs> well, look before. <laughs> Oh, and you can't forget about the time David brought his friend into a bathroom only for them to walk into Jason Nash fully naked because for whatever reason, sexually assaulting people is funny to them. Come in, just don't look to the right, okay? Don't look to the right. Oh my god! I've never seen one before! Welcome to New York! I'd also like to point out, while this is David's content, the blame also lands on Jason. I'd even argue he's just as bad, or worse, because you would think that a grown man who's almost 50 could comprehend the fact that maybe forcing someone to see you naked isn't funny, and is just gross. Paisley Jane also came out with a statement and said David filmed her late mother without consent and refused to remove the video of her from the vlog for two years after being asked. Paisley also explained that her mother had bipolar disorder. Oh, David Dobrik is a piece of shit now. I can finally say something. My mom died two months ago. David Dobrik has had a video of her up, defaming her, basically making money off of her looking like a fool for about two years, no matter how many times I ask him to take it down. Don't let the be careful, be careful fool you. David did not give her a cent, she told me, and they did not get her consent. They were just gonna make money off of somebody they assumed was too messed up to remember. This is my mama before everything went bad. This is who she really was. So can we let her rest? She's dead now. She's dead, okay? So take the damn video down. I've asked a million times. My mom was bipolar because she was abused and raped as a child. She had 14 forced abortions because they kept getting her pregnant. But hey, we all know David. If he wants to mock a mentally ill person and make fun of them for views, he's going to do that because content. Now where I'm truly dumbfounded is, Jeff did a stun horror video with David where he attached himself to an excavator and spun around, which he then face planted into. He could have lost his eye and had to go under multiple surgeries. He also now has severe damage to his brain because of the stun, which has left him to deal with severe depression. And while David ended up paying for his medical bills, he also didn't talk to Jeff for months after the accident had happened. I want to point out that while I'm not going to put too much blame on Jeff or be too harsh on David for the stun, I do think however that this is a great example as to why you should probably listen to the announcer on TV when they say do not try this at home. Someone on Twitter had also alleged David used to drive up to UCLA on Thursdays to pick up 18 year old girls and ask them to get intimate with older men. The older men were standing in front of David as he asked the girls. There was then a thread made on Reddit due to this where someone had responded by saying I remember those vlogs. He would ask those girls if they would be interested in having sex with his friends or if they would kiss his friends. Some said yes and some said no. And that used to be the end of the whole bit. He didn't tell them to actually have sex with them. That being said, I did end up finding some clips of David going to college campuses, this one being titled First Time at a College, where he would harass college girls and ask them if they would date his friend. But it's now no sign of a girlfriend. Oh, you can come in. He's just looking for a girlfriend. Do you, do you want to be a girlfriend? What about people in that room? You want a boyfriend? With all these allegations and videos resurfacing, you'd only wonder how they'd all respond. Well, 
it was done very poorly. Dom released TikToks joining the Bulletproof Challenge, mocking why he was kicked out of the group. He later then apologized, however, and said sorry to the victims, and stated, I definitely empathize with the pain everyone has suffered, but contradicted himself later on by saying as far as I know, everything was consensual. Oh yeah man, you really do empathize with your accusers, so much that you'll deny the allegations despite the fact that in a video, you acknowledge the behavior they're claiming you placed upon them. During March, multiple Vlog Squad members spoke up. Jeff Wittick uploaded a video called My Truth that repeated what he said on Twitter. He denied buying the alcohol and denied Trisha as a non-credible source. He also then tried to discredit Kat, the insider journalist, by playing part of an audio recording of their conversation without context. In the audio, Kat appears to apologize to Jeff and she believes he may have just been a bystander. He then encouraged viewers to critique Kat for still choosing to include his name in the article. It's all just because I was trying to help by telling the reporter the truth. I asked the reporter if she was sorry for twisting my words and causing all this now because um, I'm sure she had a, an idea about you know what would, what the aftermath of this would be but um, I just wanted to know if she had any any sort of sympathy for you know knowing that I was innocent and still doing this and I even have her saying to me on the phone that she believes me that I'm innocent but she still went ahead and twisted my words so fuck it i'll put the video in jeff i am i am very very sorry to hear that like i feel like you were more of an innocent well i feel like you were more of a bystander in the overall conflict and i am very sorry that that is headed your way i don't think that anything else is going to come out that will like involve you specifically because are you sorry to hear I mean, it or are you sorry me. that like you wrote you worded it that way though like it, it sounds like like I mean, I'm sorry to hear it because ultimately, like, I had to do that for my job. Like, that's just, like, what I had to do with the information that I was presented with. But I am sorry to hear that. Don't paint me like I'm a piece of shit, because all I gotta do is release the rest of this phone call. However, Kat later explained that the missing context, she was apologizing that people were calling him a rapist and a pedophile. She wasn't calling him a bystander for the alcohol involved. Jeff then decided to appear on the Frenemies podcast to talk about it, but was ripped apart by both Ethan and Trisha. He assumed that Trisha was the only source of him saying that he bought the alcohol in the article, but the article brought up many other names as well. He also says that he didn't read the article, which doesn't shock me because of how he's been responding throughout this entire situation. You said a bunch of times in your video that Trisha is the reason you're in this article. Did you did you read the article? I didn't want to pay for the paywall on it. Yeah. Paywall on it. No, I listen, I I, uh, I don't want to make any jokes. I just have it. <clears throat> sarcastic tone like I, I want I want to be clear that I'm here. So, but do, you, not, do you acknowledge not, that it wasn't Trisha just saying that? Now, after listening to you guys uh, addressing the article a bunch of times, yeah, I understand. So I you really didn't read the article, or were you joking? No, listen, so uh, yeah. I'll start from the top. And like I said, you know, I'm not here to discredit the victim at all. And I want to make that clear. I'm not, I'm just here to explain my side of the story. And the reason I'm even coming on here is because I genuinely feel like, you know, this are there are some misunderstandings here when talking about how long jeff was at the apartment regarding the night with hannah he couldn't think of a proper time and denied being there for the entirety of the vlog which ethan then proved he was there for the full vlog showing an image where hannah was being held up by her friend due to being blackout drunk while having the entire group in frame well, let me ask you this you say you were there for 15 minutes do you stand by that still no i was there for probably 30 45 but i did go home i didn't stay were you there the, the whole night, night? No. So you say you were there for 30 minutes. So he, let me, can he see this photo I pull up, Dan? Uh, can you do a, a screen share? Well, you can look at the stream, I guess, if that's possible. What I have here is a photo at the end of the night taken at 1.18 a.m. from one of the witnesses, one of the girls there. It has in it all of you guys outside, Todd, you, Jonah, David. I don't see the photo anywhere. It'll pop up on the stream. And then what And then what? What you see here is one of the girlfriends holding up Hannah, who was the victim, because she's blackout drunk. You can see her here being held up right here. And all of you guys there. Now. So don't see it. So. <clears throat> it'll be there in a moment. So what this proves 
And then I'm, I'm assuming you were there when the girls arrived. They arrived around 11, so that means you were there for two hours. I feel like Jeff is defending his friends for the sake of defending his friends, which is a normal thing to do. I can hold sympathy in regards that he doesn't want his friends to get in trouble. However, when you're shielding them to this capacity in a situation like this, you're not just being a good friend, you're also attempting to discredit victims. David then released his second apology, this time on his main channel, and this sort of expanded more on what needed to be addressed than his last one. He even talked about how he has a trouble addressing the situations correctly. Also acknowledging how his last response video was a testament to that. I put myself in a lot of situations where I needed to apologize for my past actions and I've never done this correctly and I've never done this respectfully and my last video is a testament to that. I, I, I don't want to defend that video. I don't want to delete that video. He starts off by discussing the dirty Dom allegations by saying that he believes Hannah. I want to start this video off by saying I fully believe the woman who came out against Dom and said she was by him. Um, as it was reported, the next day I got consent to post the video. Even though I got the consent to post that video, I should have never posted it. And I, what, what I understand now, and I didn't understand before, is that she sent that text because she felt like she had to not because she wanted to. He then discusses his understanding of the power dynamic he has towards those around him. I don't want to use buzzwords to try to justify this or explain this, but all I can say is people felt like they had to be silent for the sake of my video, and that's not right, and it's fucked up, and I'm sorry. He then talks about the other allegations that had been brought forward against Dom and apologizes that he had never listened to any of them and took Dom's word. I also want to acknowledge the women that spoke out against Dom in 2018. I'm talking about Allie, and then I'm talking about other girls that address their problems privately or publicly. Um, I'm sorry I didn't listen to you guys. I am sorry that I, that I took Dom's word um, for what happened those, in those certain situations, and I didn't believe you. And not only did I not believe you, but I made a joke of, of what kind of a person Dom was, because I couldn't wrap my head around a childhood friend of mine doing this to people and actually hurting people. David then discusses how he's sorry for platforming Dom and platform jokes surrounding sexual assault. David then claims to have been separated from Dom in 2019. Not only did I discredit you, Abby, but I platformed Dom. And not only did I platform Dom, but I platformed the subject of sexual in a negative way where I made jokes about it. and. I reinforce that kind of behavior and I'm so sorry and I really let not only you down but a lot of people down, a lot of people that watch me and my friends and family for that. I made the decision to no longer film with Dom in 2019 and I'm not saying my content has been brilliant since then but that's when I first started taking into account um, the power dynamic. But there are videos with him in 2020. He was also promoting Dom at the end of April 2020. Him, Jason, and Nick were still all following him on all social media as well. He then finishes off by discussing how he wants to be able to make content without creating an area of discomfort for the people involved. And I want to be able to have a place of checks and balances. I want to have HR and I want to be able um, to have people communicate discomfort in a way that's, that's comfortable to them and where, where they don't feel like their emotions or what they're doing or, or how they're acting is compromised. A question I've seen many people ask was, how did this go on so long until now? Why didn't anyone say anything when the videos were originally uploaded? I mean, the videos were there, so why did everyone wait so long until people actually came out to talk about their experience? The simple answer for this is that we were limited to what we could see. There's only so much you can observe through a video, and through that observation, there's only so much of the puzzle you can piece together. Even with the night regarding Dirty Dom and Hannah, everybody seemed find in the vlog. David's videos are vague when it comes to how people truly feel. You could blame that on editing choices, but that would just be brushing the surface. Many of the ex-members were scared to say no or deny opportunities from David because they felt that they would be removed out of the vlogs or out of the group entirely. I'd even feel confident saying that they didn't just feel this way, but they knew that if they spoke up, their removal would become inevitable. It happened with their old producer, and it happened with Nick. This puts pressure on people to speak up against David's actions, so it makes sense that we only found 
found out about all the terrible stuff that had gone on when people came out, despite it being in plain sight. Because when people watched the videos, we observed it as a group of people having fun, when that was very far from the truth. When people call David a frat boy, it's not to diminish anything that he's done to people or an excuse for his behavior. It's an insult, an implication of his careless behavior towards those around him and his ignorance towards consent. I don't think he does the things he does with malice. In fact, I don't think he's completely aware of the impact his actions have, which is what leads to everyone calling him nothing more than a frat boy, an idiot at best. While I don't think he comes with bad intentions, however, I believe he lacks care for those around him. He's more invested in his work, making content, which is fine, but if you prioritize your desires over others' safety and mental well-being, then don't be surprised when the relationships you hold with those around you start to crumble. He promises in his apology that he wants to create a safer space for those around him. And now that he's back to uploading, I hope for the sake of those involved in his vlogs, and for David, he practices what he preaches. Friends.